I said it's a super cozy paint spot. It sort of reminds you of like, you know, pulling up to like a dragon, you know, movie theater or whatever. The only cure is more cowbell.
Good evening. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Harpreet Singh. I'm a first year at the college studying government and a member of the JFK Jr. Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, which is also listed on your program. You can also follow us on Instagram at JFK Junior Forum. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming tonight's guests, Foreign Minister Yoon Young Kwan, Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, General Vincent Brooks, and tonight's moderator, Eric Rosenbach. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Rosenbach. I'm the co-director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. I'll be the moderator for tonight. I'm by no means a Korea expert or anywhere near as smart as these three guests. Uh, but I'm going to moderate, have a good discussion. And most importantly, I wanted to welcome you to the inaugural Korean Security Summit here at Harvard. The first time we've ever done this. I think you all can imagine putting together any conference is a huge amount of work. Putting together any conference at Harvard, possibly the most bureaucratic place on earth, is an even bigger deal. So I want to say a special word of thanks to John Park, who's done a lot of the heavy lifting, um, and his team for doing that. And the truth is that we're really lucky to have this conference right now at this time. In the wake of the breakup of the Hanoi summit, uh, the timing could not be better. There's a lot going on with the nuclear negotiations as they relate to North Korea and the United States, and a lot from a broader perspective as well. So we start with thinking about the failure of the summit uh, in Hanoi. And despite you know, some of the positive gloss that may have been put on what happened in Hanoi by the president, um, some of his administration, others in South and North Korea, we want to take a look at that. We want to try to get down to some of the real facts and try to think about where this is going. On top of that, though, we don't want to ignore the fact that the North Koreans in particular are active in doing other things. For example, attacks in cyberspace, cyber theft, pretty massive human rights violations. So although we want to focus on the nuclear issue, we don't want to forget those in the overall fabric, strategic fabric of what's going on um, with negotiations with North Korea. Um, so amid all of this dramatic activity, we really couldn't pick a better panel to have a discussion with tonight. We're very excited about this. So I'd like to start by introducing former Foreign Minister Yoon. Minister Yoon um, was the foreign minister in South Korea from 2003 and 2004. He has a PhD from Johns Hopkins SAIS and has been at the Korean National University, South Korean National University for many years, a preeminent academic and analyst of all things North Korea and nuclear as well. Thank you, Minister Yoon, for coming. Um, next, we have uh, Ambassador Kathleen Stevens. And we're particularly proud to have Ambassador Stevens here, not only because she was the first woman ambassador and Korean-speaking ambassador to the Republic of Korea, but she's a Kennedy School alum, and she's an MPP, a Master's of Public Policy alum. So when you think about uh, MPPs now, and I know many of you are out there in the audience, and you look at her career as a Foreign Service officer, you should think 
that's a really amazing career. This is something so impressive. So while she was the ambassador to South Korea, she's done many other things. For example, she was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, a Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State as well, two very senior positions within the State Department, served in the White House over many different administrations, right? So this is the type of public servant that we at the Kennedy School want our students to admire, emulate, and strive to have a career as impressive as that. Thank you, Ambassador, for being here. Um, General Vince Brooks, uh, we're also very happy to have. Also, we'll start with what's most important to the Kennedy School, another Kennedy School alum. He was a National Security Fellow here at the Kennedy School for a year. And I know from some personal experience that General Brooks is also one of those public servants that we should be very grateful to uh, in the United States. So he started out uh, at West Point and in something that makes him a pretty historic figure was the first African-American first cadet at West Point and has gone on to a career of very many distinguished positions. Um, some of those including, he was the commander of First Cav, uh, in Iraq during a time of the surge, a very stressful time, the deputy commander of Central Command during another time uh, important in Iraq, um, a four-star general in charge of Army Pacific, so a very important position for the U.S. Army, but ended as the U.S. Forces Korea commander most recently. Uh, and you know, it's hard to describe that job without thinking that job when you're in Korea is almost like being a king because when the four star walks into the room, whether you're an American or in the Korean military, you know, there's this sense of awe. In this case, we're even luckier because General Books is a very humble person. And so there are maybe some people in the past who've had four stars who haven't been as humble as he had. Uh, so what we're gonna do tonight is I, I wanted to start uh, because although we have a lot of Korea experts in the audience. There are some who may not know the ins and outs of all the details of the nuclear negotiations. So I wanted to start, if I could, uh, General Brooks, by just painting the picture, if you could please, of why this matters. So the North Korean nuclear program has some, you know, very apparent significance to the United States and Korea, but what does that mean in terms of the overall security situation? And why should we think about it from a perspective of just more than nuclear weapons? Well, Eric, first, uh, thanks for the privilege of being with you. And it's always good to be back here at the Kennedy School in the forum. I didn't think I'd be on this side of the stage, but uh, here we are. And so those of you out there who are currently studying, your time will come to be on this side. Be ready. Uh, let me just say this. I, I, I would say that there has already been a serious military danger in North Korea uh, that has been the case in the years since the 1953 armistice. The force really never got very small. It did back up, but it didn't get very small. Uh, the North Koreans can still field a million to 1.5 million troops, and they have uh, thousands of artillery pieces, uh, many of those, hundreds of those in range of Seoul, uh, and able to create immediate effects on that. So that was already a level of military danger that had been just part of the fabric of the armistice all these years. The pursuit of nuclear weapons and really the attainment of nuclear capability where North Korea has demonstrated themselves to be raised it to another level. And indeed, as uh, we saw these things coupled with long-range missiles, especially intercontinental ballistic missiles, now all of the alliance relationships of the United States, all of them are in range. And so it changes the situation from being a Korea-centric or even a Northeast Asia-centric problem to now one that is much more global in scale and nature. And that's what I think has driven the international community to respond the way they have with South Korean and U.S. leadership. Okay. Um, so Ambassador Stevens uh, and Minister Yun, what I'm going to ask is for the two of them to start to play a little role reversal. So I'm going to ask... Ambassador Stevens to talk a little bit about the Korean perspective and for her to try to get inside Kim Jong-un's head and President Moon's head and talk about what are the dynamics from the Korean side right now that are driving these negotiations and how should, if this is at least mostly an American audience, how should we interpret and understand the leadership situation there and what they're thinking? Well, uh, thank and you. And obviously, yeah. two different ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> All 
All right, well, thank you, Eric. And actually, before I do that, I too have to add my thanks for the invitation to come back here. Uh, it's a little trip down memory lane for me. And in fact, I walked down Shaler Lane, where I used to live, which is part of memory lane for me here in Cambridge. I actually came to the Kennedy School in 1989 after spending six years in Korea. Uh, from 1983 until 1989. It's a long time for a diplomat. A lot of things happened, and I spent my year here actually reflecting on democratization, the role the U.S. played, a lot of security issues we dealt with then, the role of the press, uh, negotiations. Uh, and uh, while I was here, and I remember sitting in here for, a, for a, a, a big session, it was as the Berlin Wall was falling. And I actually took some of those lessons, I think both from the Kennedy School and thinking about Korea, to uh, actually the Balkans, where I spent a lot of the, the, the following 15 years. So I guess it's just to add to you, this has a, a lot of resonance for me as I think about uh, the issues that I've wrestled with the, in, in my career. Yeah. Um, yeah, with respect with thinking about Korea, again, as, as, as an American, as an outsider, uh, I would just add to what General Brooks said, of, you know, Korea matters, you know, it, and Korea has mattered to the United States and actually to the world in a way since, well, a long time, but since the beginning of the 20th century. What's happened on Korea has really shaped the role of the great powers in the region, uh, the, the, the emergence of modern Asia, and it matters now, you know, as we, as we, not only in terms of the continuing threat, if you like, from North Korea and the fact that it's such an outlier, but in terms of our alliance relationships, in terms of how this very dynamic area is going to move forward. Um, within that, I think we cannot forget, and I appreciate the question, although I have to a answer it, I think, with, with <laughs> uh, appropriate humility, um, that this is the Korean Peninsula, and uh, we, we need to try to do our best to understand the dynamics there from kind of historical and cultural, and if you like, you're asking me kind of a personality perspective, almost. Uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, he is the, the third member of a dynasty, I think that's a fair thing to call it, uh, the Kim dynasty, which began with his grandfather, who set up, of course, the regime that uh, ruled the divided half of North Korea uh, in the aftermath of the end of World War II and the end of Japanese occupation. Um, the young Kim, he's in his 30s, uh, seems in many ways different from his father or his grandfather in terms of having had some Western exposure. He has certainly proved to be, since he came to power uh, with the death of his father in 2012, to be uh, quite brutal, to be very determined, to consolidate his power. And I think what we've seen now over from 2012 until now, here we are in 2019, this young man's been in power for a long time. And he spent a few years really consolidating his power by getting rid of, of potential uh, rivals within this very totalitarian system. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he accelerated the program that his grandfather, and particularly his father, had begun to develop nuclear weapons and missile delivery systems as, if you like, uh, I think it'd be fair to say, there's an asymmetrical response mm -hmm. to what they see as a security threat or military threat from South Korea and its ally, the United States. Uh, as South Korea became so much more prosperous and North Korea was no longer able to compete in such a traditional way. And he really doubled down on that. And certainly during your tenure there, we saw, we saw Kim, Kim Jong-un go much further than his father was able to get in terms of actually developing a nuclear arsenal of, you know, of some, I guess, I don't know if you'd use the word respectable, but of some, some sizable uh, import. And with that, the, the, the nuclear, uh, the, the missile delivery system as well. And then at the end of 2017, he pivoted pretty quickly, and we yeah. could talk more about that, towards this uh, uh, notion of a different kind of future for North Korea, which would include economic development, which clearly I think he also wants to see. Koreans, whether they're in North Korea or South Korea, are proud people. They don't think they're second to anybody, despite a very difficult history, and they're not. But North Korea clearly has not had the success that South Korea has in terms of emerging as an economy, in terms of, of developing in any way other than this nuclear program. So he has a number of goals, and I think what we can say about him is that he is uh, focused uh, and ruthless, uh, but also, I mean, in some ways you would say inexperienced, but in other ways he's been in power now for longer than other leaders on the world stage. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't underestimate him, and we can talk more about that. Uh, in the South, uh, you have a very different political situation, obviously. Uh, th the word that's most often used is almost a cliche to talk about Korean democracy is to call it dynamic or vibrant. Uh, <laughs> and that's sometimes used with almost a sense of sort of an edge. It is that. Um, they change presidents every five years. 
And sometimes they do it in, in a pretty dramatic fashion, although always through a democratic means. So we have a president now in, uh, in South Korea, Moon Jae-in, who comes from what's called the progressive side of the, of the spectrum. Uh, these words progressive and conservative mean a bit of a different thing in the Korean context than they do here. I'm not sure what they mean here anymore sometimes, but, uh, <laughs> but he comes from that side. He is a product of a system that has seen power transfer every fi you know, five years from one side of the political spectrum or 10 years to the other peacefully. That's an admirable thing. And he came to power with a, a, a strong uh, a public mandate uh, to address a lot of domestic issues in South Korea. It's about the economy there too, and corruption and inequality and youth opportunity and a whole spectrum we don't hear too much about in the United States in terms of South Korea, but he's a democratic president, so, you know, small d, with all of those demands. And also with a, with a commitment to do what every South Korean president wants to do, conservative or progressive. And that is be the South Korean president that achieves a breakthrough with South Korea, and at the same time keep South Korea safe and maintains a strong relationship and alliance with the United States. Now, there's a lot of debate in South Korea about how he should approach that and how he's doing, but he certainly, at the end of 2017, uh, uh, grasped the opportunity he saw when Kim Jong-un was ready to pivot away from this more provocative stage towards a negotiation and has tried to make the most of it. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk more about what he has done, but to do that on what is sometimes called this inter-Korean track, this is a divided country. And there is a desire, as we see in other divided places, for reconciliation, for tension reduction, for you know, humanitarian sort of relief for the many, many divided families and the suffering people of South Korea. But how do you do that and at the same time stay well in step with the, de with the demands, not only of the United States, but the international community to address the non-proliferation and other issues on the Korean Peninsula? Great, thank you very much. Now, Minister Yoon, to you the question is turned around. What's the perspective of the Koreans, either the North or the South Koreans if you want, on the United States and President Trump and how the dynamic may have changed with President Trump now in office? And we know that he made a very dramatic change in terms of the policy of negotiating um, with the North Koreans. What's your perspective on all this from the Korean perspective? Uh, first of all, it is my great uh, pleasure and privilege to participate in this forum. And thank you for inviting me to this place. And uh, first, uh, let me say this way. Um, many people couldn't sleep well in 2017, I mean, uh, because of the uh, military tension, and uh, they really worried about the possibility of war, military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, for example, twice, I mean, aircraft carrier, three aircraft carrier groups, I mean, approached the Korean Peninsula twice in 2017. And that was a kind of scary moment uh, for uh, Koreans, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, but after uh, President Trump decided to meet uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un person to person, the situation changed radically from a crisis situation to the peaceful search for diplomatic solution of the crisis. So, Many Koreans, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, gave a positive evaluation on that kind of uh, important decision to meet him, to meet Chairman Kim person to person. I think that makes uh, important uh, sense because, in my personal view, uh, pressure only tactics uh, against North Korea. Uh, cannot work uh, because in the, re in the uh, last two and a half decades, the mainstream approach uh, of the U.S. government focusing mainly on pressuring North Korea didn't work. After they, even after they made some kind of agreement with the United States, they continued uh, to defect from that agreement. Uh, what I mean is without change or uh, fundamental change of U.S.-North Korea relationship, I think this kind of vicious circle continued. And for the first time, uh, President Trump uh, decided to engage North Korean leader uh, politically 
And I think uh, it's a kind of uh, paradigm shift uh, toward a positive direction. And if this uh, I mean, new approach can be implemented uh, prudently and carefully, I think there will be more chance for the peaceful resolution of this nuclear crisis. So uh, basically, my understanding of the Korean people uh, peop their view on uh, President Trump's performance in the recent uh, I mean, uh, years is positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you'll often hear as a criticism of the Trump administration that the president gave up one of his biggest chits by meeting with Kim Jong-un before he had gotten any concessions. What's your perspective on that? As, as we start to work up through the history of getting to Hanoi, and then look forward. Was it a mistake to have met personally with Kim Jong-un so early, or is that an advantage as we're looking forward after Hanoi? If we consider uh, the danger that the United States is facing uh, uh, from North Korea, I mean, uh, for example, they could succeed in testing ICBM in 2017, and North Korea has become a direct military threat uh, to Americans uh, here. C if we consider that kind of uh, I mean, uh, difficult uh, situation, I think it, I it was worthwhile for him to meet him person to person if there is a chance to resolve this peacefully. So I think that was a kind of positive uh, development uh, because in that way, uh, I mean, there would be uh, the reduction of mutual suspicion between two countries. And uh, in that way, I think uh, uh, the U.S. policymakers can mitigate uh, the security concern of North Koreans. Uh, and that may weaken, uh, probably, the motivation for them to own nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So I think it opened a new uh, door for successful solution of this uh, crisis, I mean, important crisis for, okay. for Americans. So I'm rather positive. Okay. Um, Ambassador Stevens, when you look at the summit in Hanoi, there were very few people who predicted that it would blow up as quickly as it did. Uh, and so I'm interested in your thoughts on why that happened. And then if I could ask even more specifically, you know, we talk a lot at the Kennedy School about just how much work you have to put in to a negotiation in order for you to have even the expectation, even modest expectation that it might succeed. And if you talk to someone like Wendy Sherman, or Ambassador Burns, or even Secretary Carter and I, when we were doing negotiations, there's a ton of work that goes into the details of a negotiation. Mm -hmm. So first, could you give me your thought on why it actually blew up? And then for the Kennedy School students and others in the audience, the practitioners, about that importance of preparation and what that may or may not have had to do with the summit blowing up as it did. Well, I mean, I, I do think that inadequate preparation had a lot to do with the absence of satisfactory outcome from Hanoi. Um, I mean, going back to the earlier point, I mean, I, I, I do agree that maybe breaking this taboo of the two leaders meeting uh, was a, a good and useful thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you do have to build on it. And I think between what we saw was between Singapore and Hanoi, um, this process of kind of building towards the next summit uh, didn't happen, and uh, even though it is important to meet together to get to to address misunderstandings, those meetings clearly did not really begin to address the issues that needed to be addressed. My own theory of the case is just a theory. I mean, is, is I, I think Kim Jong Un himself. You asked me about him earlier. Probably went into it a little bit overconfident. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, it. It was, it was a big deal for him to have met, to be the first North Korean leader to meet an American president. Um, he, at the Singapore summit, um, the, the, the statement that came out of it was very much um, a, a statement that reflected, uh, I think, North Korean priorities and perspectives more than what turned out to be U.S. ones. 
So if you had that coming out of Singapore and then a process afterwards where I think that kind of work that Wendy and others talk about that I've seen myself of, yes. of getting to the details just didn't happen. I'm not really blaming the US side entirely for that. I think that maybe on the North Korean side there was a sense that maybe we're better off kind of like we did in Singapore of just going in there and, uh, and that President Trump is going to want a deal. So I think there was some overconfidence and some miscalculation mm -hmm. on the part of the North Koreans. I think there's probably some on the part of the Americans. And mm -hmm. that happens in negotiations, but when it happens at the summit level, it gets a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, Can I thank just you. throw a comment in on, yeah. on top of that Go as ahead, well? I, I think that these are uh, very important dynamics and great observations that have been made. A part of this has to do, though, with the nature of how this dynastic regime in North Korea works. And so the challenge for being able to do traditional symmetry, developing things from the bottom up and having a good laid out plan that essentially gets finalized at the summit level, entirely appropriate everywhere in the world, isn't entirely appropriate here. And so North Korea has a different problem. Who can speak for Kim Jong-un? That's a very, very small circle. And the degree of speaking that these persons are able to do, primarily Kim Jong-chol, who has been his, his emissary, that's limited to conveying a message as opposed to negotiating. So the mechanism by which we would see this normally happen, that structure doesn't exist from North Korea. Now they have a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they have assistant ministers, both of whom are well familiar with the United States and have met with uh, a number of Americans in the past as, as well as in recent times. But it's very clear and it was evident here in this case uh, going into Hanoi that they aren't speaking for Kim Jong-un. And so I think that what may be in play here is Kim Jong-un wants to reserve to himself the level of the, the, the deal, not, not so much the level at which the deal is made, but the, the aspects of it and the significance of the things he really wants. And we haven't gotten to that yet. And he's only going to reveal it to President Trump. So I think this is a very different dynamic. It's not something he's going to reveal to his foreign ministry. He's not going to reveal to Kim Jong-chol even. He will reserve it to himself to deliver what it is he thinks is necessary. And when we start talking about security guarantees, it's important to realize what that might mean. So it's natural to think of the military security aspects, but that may not be all there is. What does economic security look like for North Korea? Is it to continue to be uh, dominated economically by China and have more than 90% of their trade controlled by China and still not be able to develop? Or is it to turn away from this degree of dominance from China? This is a very different geopolitical question than the natural military security questions. And I think that has to be understood as one of the dynamics that um, perhaps Kim Jong-un is reaching for. Mm -hmm. So um, Mr. Yuan, that's a great question for you. Imagine you're the senior advisor to President Trump now, and you're advising him how to move forward after Hanoi. What would you tell him? What are the most important things to put on the table? And then process-wise, how would you approach it? And then, uh, General Brooks, I'm going to ask you the same question for Kim Jong-un. It'll be the one time you can hear the USFK commander advising Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Mr. Yun. Should I be a little diplomatic or? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, for, for our purposes here, just tell it like it is. Bullet points, straight out, very okay, quick. Okay, okay. Especially um, for President Trump. You got to <laughs> tell it like you mean it. Uh, some people here in this country seem to favor the idea of so-called Libya model. I mean, uh, you North Koreans mm -hmm. are Some transfer. people, you can be more explicit. Are you talking about the <laughs> National Security Advisor? Or? <laughs> uh, and uh, they tend to argue that you do, and, uh, I mean, uh, transfer all the weapons outside of North Korea. I mean, uh, then we will return. I mean, uh, I mean, that kind of idea, I don't know. I mean, I think that may be probably impractical because uh, first of all, uh, North Korean leader will be reminded of the fate of uh, Gaddafi, uh, what happened to him. Yeah. So I think uh, it is uh, impracticable. And uh, Okay, so no, no Libya model. What are your next two bullet points for the president? Uh, if North Korea 
uh, agrees on uh, on the I mean final goal. I mean F F V D final and uh, uh, final and uh, fully verified dismantlement of a nuclear web a nuclear program uh, as their final goal. And if they agree on certain rough roadmap, and then probably. I would advise President Trump uh, to return to the flexible, more flexible approach, such as uh, action for action in parallel, which was stated by Ambassador Vegan in his uh, mm -hmm. speech in Stanford. Right. So returning back to that flexible position, I think that would be better, more reasonable. I mean, position, and that will open the opportunity of successful compromise between two uh, parties, okay. North Korea and the United States. So President Trump, he likes to think of things um, in a way and how likely it is to succeed. What percent likelihood do you think it is that there's a deal by the end of the Trump administration? Some type of deal. <laughs> now, this could be a trick question. What's the likelihood that the president says, I got a deal, and it could be different than having a deal, but you can decide what you want to answer. The likelihood there's a deal. I guess there may be more than 50% of chance for a reasonable deal. Really? Uh, on on uh, denuclearization, denuclearization of North Korea before his term ends. Okay. Uh, for example, if they could agree on uh, such an agreement for exchanging dismantlement of Yongbyon nuclear facilities uh, in return for establishment of liaison office and uh, declaration of the end of Korean War and the partial uh, lifting of economic sanction before the, the end of his term, I think that would lead to a, a better uh, I mean, uh, I mean deal in the later period. Okay. So I think that would be kind of an, a positive progress. Okay, yeah. more likely than not, that's the bet. Okay, yeah. General Brooks, you're advising Kim Jong-un. What are the top three talking points? Uh, f first, Chairman Comrade Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Very well done, General. The, the first thing that would have to happen uh, is I would suggest to him causing the Korea issue and the conditions of North Korea to be elevated to the international stage and to keep it there, something his father and grandfather did not do. So I would, remi would remind him he was successful in doing that. However, in doing so, Chairman Comrade Kim Jong-un, you have put at risk everything that you created. And so your physical security is reduced by the presence and the possession of nuclear weapons. Your economic security is in grave danger. It cannot even begin because of the possession of nuclear weapons. If you are to realize what it is that you have a vision of for North Korea, you must release the nuclear weapons. Now, how, how can that happen? Chairman Comrade Kim Jong-un, you have no reason to trust the United States. Your experience has given you no basis to do that. But you do know that since 1953, the United States leading the United Nations Command has never attacked, not once. And so in this moment of time that you have, you should express what it is that you desire in a serious and very direct way with the President of the United States. You can't maneuver through conditions like, well, sanctions removal is all I want when it isn't. It's clear there's something deeper, Chairman Comrade Kim Jong-un. You must express what it is that you desire if this negotiation is to move in a direction that you deliver peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and unfold the potential of North Korea into the future. And the last thing I would say to him is, Chairman Comrade Kim Jong-un, be mindful of the calendar. So at the present time, you have a president in the Republic of Korea who desires to try to move forward and is willing to take risk in doing so, political risk uh, internationally and domestically. And you have a United States president who has expressed a willingness to meet with you twice. What will the case be in 2020 to 2022? 
So for sure, the Korean government will change in 2022 unless the Constitution changes. It's a five-year term. And possibly, the U.S. government may change. Will you have as good a chance in 2020 to 22 or beyond as you have right now? Chairman Comrade, mind the calendar. These would be my pieces of advice. And then I would get shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ambassador Stevens, um, you know, there's sometimes this question about when you're in negotiations with someone like Kim Jong-un or uh, Vladimir Putin or even President Xi about whether or not you can trust them. Mm -hmm. The other opinion would be, don't worry about trust. You just have to find some place where there are overlapping interests. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that? in the case of North Korea and the United States. Mm -hmm. And then could you also talk about what are the US interests in this case other than just the nuclear issue that we either should recognize but dismiss or that we can't dismiss and we have to keep our eye on? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just to touch on the last thing first is a very sure. important question is, I do think we have to, to remind ourselves that uh, what the U.S. has been, I think, successful in doing, along with our, our South Korean ally and with our other allies in the region, is contributing to overall peace and prosperity in the Asia-Pacific mm -hmm. uh, for the last 70 years. Uh, and, and so we have to be very mindful, I think, of our alliance equities in this and the importance of staying on the side of, if you like, the Korean people and our democratic right. and our values aspirations for the Korean Peninsula. Um, so keep our eyes on that. And I would also say, I, I personally, I don't think we're going to solve the nuclear issue without thinking about the broader, you know, unfinished business on the Korean Peninsula, the division yes. of, the, of the peninsula, right. this state we've been in for a long time. There has to be, so I would certainly say, and this goes back to, I think, your earlier question, kind of broaden the perspective, you know, what's the, the ex expression about, I think we've done that, if you can't solve the problem, make it bigger you know, it has to be even bigger than giving up the nuclear weapons. It really has to be addressing. And I think there's been some effort to do that over the years, but that remains central. Um, now, I mean, in terms of negotiating and building trust, yeah, I tend to kind of avoid the word trust. Um, I think, uh, and as, as you were uh, giving your briefing to Kim Jong-un, I was trying to think about being Kim Jong-un here, <laughs> and I thought, I, 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 I think I, I would have been a little bit more susceptible to that argument before Hanoi than after. Um, I, I think that the, um, one of the problems from Hanoi was um, this sense that uh, uh, Kim went in with some expectations, and, I'm sorry, and, and President Trump turned out to come up with something that was entirely unexpected. Uh, so I know that there was efforts afterwards to try to maintain the relationship, on the, and I think that's the right thing to do, but I think that the, the confidence level is, is even lower now, if you like, probably on both sides, but certainly, certainly on, the, on the North Korean side. I think you have to build confidence. I think this is where the South Koreans' uh, role is very important, the kind of confidence-building measures that are taking place on the ground in the military area to lower tensions that helps to create the atmosphere. Um, but, but there's important work to be done on the American side too. And now that you know, I'm yes. out of the US government, I mean, I can say again, your description of kind of that, that issue of you know, Kim Jong-un is the only one who can negotiate for North Korea. I think there's a perception anyway that when it comes to the American system, you know, maybe you know, uh, no one else can really, it really knows what President Trump is going to do. Now, there are a lot of veterans in this audience of previous efforts to negotiate um, with North Korea. And so there's a lot of people who know from the scars on them that, as a former boss of mine used to say, that the toughest diplomacy is the interagency process. Mm. You know, there's always <laughs> been a lot of division. This is not a new thing. Yeah. But I think that the, the, if I may say, the kind of dysfunction and the absence of process, I know that's a boring word, in the Trump administration is not just a problem for process-oriented you know, bureaucrats like us, it's a problem for building confidence and trust because mm -hmm. you just don't see where this is going. And I have to say, I mean, I, you know, I've met a number of North Koreans and others. They do watch that calendar, boy, they know. Uh, and, and they've also seen through, you know, the, through the decades how you know, every time we seem to be getting close to something, whoop, we have an election, or the South Koreans have an election, or so, and, and the whole thing gets flipped again. So 
I'm concerned. Uh, I think we do have to think about how we try to use time on our side, but I think it's, I think it's a real challenge because there's going to be a sense that even if you reach a, an agreement, yeah, w I mean, one, within the Trump administration, will, will they change their minds? And secondly, what, what if there is a change or the Congress changes? Mm -hmm. right. If you don't mind. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Yeah, sure. add one yes, thing? Yes, of course. I think the nature of North Korean political economic system has been changing rapidly. And uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un is forced uh, to be a, a, an authoritarian uh, developmentalist leader like uh, Deng Xiaoping or uh, I mean the president, former president uh, of Korea, Park Jong-hee, somebody like that. So I would encourage uh, him, I mean, I mean, I would recommend to President Trump uh, to be a helper for him to, to go toward that direction mm -hmm. rather than remaining as a totalitarian uh, dictator there in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot imagine, I mean, uh, the transition of North Korean system, I mean, no, uh, North Korean leader from uh, I mean, uh, that kind of uh, totalitarian leader toward a democratic leader in a matter of a year or two. So I think uh, if uh, President Trump can be a helper in that regard by providing uh, some I mean, uh, I mean, advice on economic development or taking some political measures or confidence building uh, with him or something like that, I think that will be more constructive. Mm -hmm. from a long-term perspective. Okay. Yep. So we're um, going to wrap up here. We heard Mr. Yun say he gives a greater than 50% chance that there's a deal by the end of the Trump administration. General Brooks? I think there's going to be progress uh, in the next three years, but there won't be a completion of the process. We won't be at a fully final, fully verified denuclearization within the next three years. Okay. Do you have a percentage to put on it? I'll give it a 30%. 30%? Uh, we'll okay. have some satisfactory act activity, but not a sufficient level to call it All final, right. uh, fully verified denuclearization. Okay. Ambassador Stevens. <laughs> um, Forces you to think hard when you go through the artificial exercise of putting a percentage probability on a deal. Yeah, I, again, my emphasis would be on, I'm sorry, on, on a process. Uh, if there was a sustainable process that mm -hmm. could kind of get traction, uh, in, within the next year. Yeah. I think that's possible. I, <laughs> okay, I, so let me push you a little bit further. Yeah. What's the probability of a sustainable process in the next year? Well, I'll put, I'll put it at 50%. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, that's good. Yeah. So um, Worth working for. We're, we're at the time now where we go out to the audience and seeing some of the people in this crowd, we know this is a pretty expert audience as it is, um, this is the way it works at the forum for those of you who haven't been here. Uh, we have a great panel. We ask people to line up at any of the four microphones and ask a question. Remember, a question is an interrogative that is usually one or two sentences with a question mark. A question is not a prepared speech. We're here to try to benefit from the expertise of our guests here. Um, so anyone has a question, please go ahead and step up now. Looks like we have one right here. Also. Um, if you could just give a one-line identifier of who you are uh, and where you're from, that would be sure, great. Sure, I'm uh, Lenny. I'm just general public, no Harvard affiliation. And I was wondering what role we could reasonably expect China to play as currently North Korea's leading trade partner uh, in terms of e exerting economic pressure or as an intermediary or broker in the relationship. And what can we as the U.S. do to induce China to take a more active role and be a productive mm -hmm. part of that process? Okay. The other key is you ask a specific person, otherwise I'll do it, but if you had someone in mind, then you uh, can go ahead. I'll no. let you. Right, okay, Ambassador, why don't you go ahead? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm glad you raised it, I really am, because I think that one thing that's quite missing from most of the discussion about what's going on right now is the broader regional dimension. Uh, I do think we share some interests, I didn't really answer your question about interests earlier, but we share some interests with China, in including, I mean, importantly, that neither of us really do want, want to see North Korea retain this nuclear capability uh, and want to see New York, uh, North Korea play a, a, a less provocative role in the neighborhood, that's true. Uh, but China needs to be part of the solution, or it needs to be part of the, again, the process. Um, 
there was something called the six-party talks. I think the idea behind that was right, and, and you know, it's what we've used in other negotiations in the world, whether it's contact groups in the Balkans or uh, uh, groups work, contact groups working on Iran and so on. You need to bring in others, and we've certainly done that in the UN, but I think there needs to be a more concentrated effort to do that. And I think with some inclusion by China, um, they can be helpful. Clearly, they, they play a very important in role, role in sanctions enforcement or lack of it. Uh, so, and I, I don't think that this kind of, uh, uh, you know, we have a meeting and then we kind of go out and kind of brief, uh, brief the other partners work. That, that goes for Japan too, which plays a different kind of role. But I think we definitely need to get them in more in the game. Right. Mr. Yun, did you have a thought on that, of the role in China in particular? I think China is taking on a very important role in the sense that uh, it uh, has been cooperating with President uh, Trump uh, on the issue of economic sanction, uh, especially uh, since the beginning of President Trump's uh, term two years ago. And I think this will have uh, important implication for uh, North Korea policy of the United States in the sense that if, for example, let's, let me assume, I mean, let me imagine that uh, uh, this government uh, keeps uh, pressuring North Korea without uh, any, I mean, dialogue, po political dialogue uh, with North Korea because they know that North Korea is, is in a very difficult economic situation nowadays. So they may believe that if we push them harder and harder for just a little more, then probably North Korea will give in and uh, come to the table and give up their nuclear option. Well, I don't know. At that kind of moment of crisis situation, probably China may intervene by loosening the economic sanction against North Korea, mm -hmm. which will mean that loss of major leverage of the United States to pressure North Korea. So I think it is important for the U.S. government to be realistic and pragmatic uh, on pushing uh, North Korea on this issue. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, we'll comment ahead. on that as well. The, the, uh, first, I, I should suggest that China will act in its own interest. Uh, that's how they maneuver. It'll be in their own interest. China has long been the economic powerhouse for North Korea, if there is such a thing. It's certainly in terms of its dominance over North Korea's economy, and yet North Korea has not developed. Uh, China was very clear in 2016 that they had three no's, three things they didn't want to see regarding the Korean Peninsula. No war, no nukes, and no instability. But they've been tolerant of everything but instability. And so they, if they can get to a status quo where it doesn't appear to be getting worse, China will be satisfied with that and will at the same time, while holding sanctions, and they have in large measure, especially things crossing from North Korea into China, they haven't been so tight on things crossing from China into North Korea. And there's been an increase in the amount of activity that's happened there in the last eight months. And so if that's the case, then we can expect that China will try to maintain a, a, a degree of leverage still over North Korea's decisions, the economic controls that they have, and also the political uh, dynamics of, of making sure that they always have one more summit than Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un has had with Moon Jae-in, for example. Because right now the score is three, four to three to two to zero to zero. And that's China's score, South Korea's score, the United States score, Russia's score, and Japan's score. Four, three, two, zero, zero. And China will maneuver quickly to try to make sure that they stay on top. So if there's another Seoul-Pyongyang summit, you can expect that probably right before that, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping will hold a summit. And we shouldn't view that as some degree of extraordinary friendship and support between China and North Korea. So they'll continue to maneuver and hedge. Uh, North Korea frustrated China quite a bit in the years leading up to 2017. China communicated that they didn't want to see nuclear testing. And this was in about April of 2017 when there were indications that uh, North Korea was preparing for a sixth nuclear test. And in large measure, North Korea didn't do anything in that period of time with regard to nuclear testing. Then there was a unanimous Security Council resolution. 
that China participated in. And then South Korea said, or North Korea said, okay, if it's going to be like that, here's number six. And then there was another unanimous Security Council resolution that included uh, China's role actively in that. And then we had the missile launch of the 29th of November. And then North Korea itself changed. So I think we should anticipate that China will work in its own interest, will try to show a dominant hand over North Korea, and uh, that we'll have to keep an eye on what their interests are actually going to manifest into. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Sai Wan, and I'm a sophomore at Harvard College right now. Um, thank you so much all for coming. <clears throat> I think this is a question for um, Minister Yoon, and we've been talking a lot about like the U.S.'s stance towards North Korea and whether or not like we think that that's you know doing well. Um, but I was really curious about like your thoughts on South Korea's policies towards North Korea and what you thought might could be done like better in terms of managing those relations. I think that's an important uh, question. Uh, and many uh, policymakers in South Korea may be thinking about that. Uh, but you know, I mean, if we uh, suppose that uh, we are in uh, their shoes, as, a political, uh, as political leaders of Korea, they might have chosen this way of uh, trying to improve inter-Korean relationship as quickly as possible while the window of opportunity is open. What I'm saying is uh, President Trump is unique in the sense that he was the first president who decided to meet uh, President, I mean Chairman Kim Jong-un person to person. And uh, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un for the first time dec declared that he would denuclearize North Korea. We didn't have, uh, I mean, uh, that kind of a statement before from North Korea. And there was some crisis, very, I mean, tense crisis in 2017. Uh, if I were a Korean president, I would have taken the same road of, I mean, uh, going forward in terms of improving inter-Korean relationship because uh, we need to establish a permanent peace system on the Korean Peninsula so that we can sleep well without worrying about war in Korea. So that may be the reason. But I think uh, and that is why, I mean, uh, in the eyes of uh, American uh, friends, South Korean government uh, hurried a little bit. But I think it is understandable considering the situation uh, of Korea. If war occurs uh, during the process of denuclearization, that will occur on the Korean Peninsula, not any other part of the world. So I think uh, that's understandable. But uh, having said that, I would like to add that it is important for our government uh, to go together with international society in terms of continuing economic sanction uh, against North Korea because that is a very important tool for international society to persuade North Korean leaders to, to, to give up their nuclear program. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, good evening and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Dan, I'm a student at the Business School and former USFK soldier at Kapsi Kapsi Da. Kapsi Kapsi Da. Uh, <laughs> cool. um, sir, my question is for you. Uh, at, you were commander of USFK and CFC when we didn't have a full ambassador to the ROC. And I'm curious, how did that complicate your job as commander of USFK and the Combined Forces Command? Thanks, Dan. And uh, I'm glad you're here. Do well. And thanks for your service. Uh, first, it, it was very interesting uh, because the, as the administrations changed, I was a part of, of course, the Obama administration's military uh, leadership as well as the Trump administration's military leadership, and thus also the Pak Geun Hye military leadership, as I was an alliance commander, and the Moon Jae-in leadership. So I had four presidents during my time in command. Uh, we were without an ambassador from the time of the administration change for the United States. And of course, there were a few more months before there was the uh, administration change in the Republic of Korea through an impeachment. A very challenging time 
to be able to convey to Washington what was really going on, uh, but making sure it was done through the proper mechanisms of an embassy. And so it required a very close relationship between myself, who I actually was not only a military commander, but was the senior U.S. government official in the country, but never presuming to be the ambassador and never presuming to speak for the embassy, but rather to speak with the embassy and let the embassy speak for itself uh, with an excellent charge d'affaires, Mark Knapper, who's now at State Department main headquarters. And so it required a closer collaboration than we might have otherwise had. I had an excellent relationship with Ambassador Mark Lippert, so I don't mean to diminish that in any way. But it was different, so he could maneuver in his lane, especially on some of the other programs that re represent the United States interests, whereas I could concentrate on the alliance. That was really my job, and a, a unique job that no one else had, to be an alliance uh, commander and leader. So my attention ended up focusing on really some of both of those. Keep a really close collaboration with the Chargé and the Embassy. Communicate with the Secretary of State when the Secretary came to Korea, and, and Secretary Tillerson did several times, and later Secretary Pompeo. And I met with each of them personally, as well as uh, their envoys at the time, uh, Joe Yoon and then uh, now Steve Began. And to give them military advice as well as a perspective. But being the senior U.S. official, lots of people talked to me from other countries. We would routinely meet with the ambassadors from the United Nations sending states, and other ambassadors asked to also have audience with the military commander because they're trying to sense, are we getting ready to go to war? And should we move our citizens? And so that created quite a bully pulpit and in some ways simplified in-country coordination while never abrogating the responsibility of the embassy to communicate back to Washington and for me to speak to the Department of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So we worked our way through it. It wasn't easy, uh, but uh, we, we did what we could and were able to make a reversal. Ambassador Stevens, do you have any thoughts on that, having been in the ambassador's seat? Uh, well, I, I think... Not the specifics. I, 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 I thank time, General Brooks for his service, too, during a very challenging <laughs> time. Uh, I, uh, I tried to, to, before I went to uh, Korea's ambassador, I had served in Korea um, uh, as a, a foreign service officer and earlier as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and I read a lot of memoirs of previous ambassadors, and I remember one in particular who uh, uh, wrote, uh, Ambassador Lilly, who I worked for, wrote in his memoir that uh, uh, he, he concluded early on that no U.S. policy in South Korea is going to work if, unless the ambassador and the U.S. Forces Korea commander spoke with one voice. So that's what I tried to do during my time there, and uh, uh, I guess you spoke with one voice, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's... Uh, it is a very, uh, yeah, I, Korea is a place where, you know, we have a large footprint and it's changed as Korea, South Korea, Republic of Korea has risen in the world to be the kind of power that it is, but perceptions sometimes lag. So the way, uh, how, how the, the commander, how the ambassador plays those public roles is also very, very important because we are part of alliance with a divided country against the other part of the divided country. So yeah. there is, it is a democracy. There is this deep rooted sense of, of pain. <laughs> as well as pride in what the alliance has been about and what the history has been about. So I think that, that it's, and we do have a large military presence there. So it, it's, of all my diplomatic assignments, I mean, you'd say, well, this alliance is great, it's very pro-American, that's all true. It's an extraordinary relationship, but it's one that has to be treated with great respect and I think sensitivity, yeah. both on the military and the diplomatic side. All right. Great, thank you. Um, yes, sir, I believe you're next. Nope, okay, he's just standing by the pillar. That makes you, yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, good evening. My name is Patrick Ramirez. I'm a junior at the college. Uh, General Book, sir, uh, you uh, said that uh, Kim Jong-un has this uh, deep interest that uh, he hasn't put on the table yet in negotiations that he wants to achieve. Uh, if you could guess what that interest is, uh, uh, what would you uh, say that might be? An economic guarantee from the United States to protect it against Chinese influence. Thank you, sir. You heard it. <laughs> All right. okay. You have a good haircut too, so I hope you're hope you're a warrior. <laughs> All right. All right. Great. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Good evening. Um, my name's Amy. I'm a Frank Knox Fellow in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So not a Kennedy School person. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> but I have worry. a clarifying question for Minister Yoon. You said that the fear experienced domestically in South Korea the visceral fear of war began to alleviate itself around the time of the Trump-Kim summit specifically. I know you didn't mention the Olympics 
Does that mean that the bilateral rapprochement between North and South Korea in terms of the soft power display, did that not have much impact domestically? Oh, no, I, I actually, uh, that was important event and President Moon tried hard to utilize Pyeongchang Olympic uh, for, uh, for a political uh, purpose in the sense that he wanted to use that as an opportunity to invite North Korean leaders uh, to South Korea and uh, in that way, there was interactions uh, began between two Koreas and, uh, uh, and North Korean leader, uh, I mean, for the first time, said that he would denuclearize uh, North Korea uh, if their security can be guaranteed. And that message was delivered to the United States and that was the beginning of uh, US-North Korea summit meeting. So, of course, Pyeongchang Olympic was important uh, in the process of uh, changing the situation uh, from crisis situation in 2017 to a kind of peaceful search for diplomatic solution in 2018. It was important. Great. Okay, sir, you got the last question. Make it good. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin, a uh, sophomore from Harvard College. I want to talk about the aspect of reunification uh, because I think it's very contingent, contingent to the idea of denuclearization. Um, I think current Korean sort of politics views uh, that unification are, has multiple possible pathways, uh, including absorption by peace, uh, uh, more of a peaceful negotiation of dual governments, or more of a militant approach. But I think if in the denuclearization happens, we'll be getting rid of some of the options that we have. Uh, what do you think, especially Ambassador, uh, that the new reunification discourse would look like if we prioritize denuclear denuclearization first? Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, as, as you asked that question, I, I spoke at the beginning of this about being in this forum in 1989 as, as the Berlin Wall fell, and, uh, you know, no one, all the smart people at the Kennedy School and Harvard and everybody else, you know, no one predicted what was coming or how it would come, you know. So <laughs> I think that there's, uh, we have to keep our minds open to the fact, the idea that things may unfold and there may be opportunities to unfold in ways that we can't, even as hard as we try, really, really think through right now. Um, I mean, that said, I, I think we have to take a, a, a kind of an approach of both a sense of urgency that this unfinished business of the Korean Peninsula has, has gone on too long. But at the same time, kind of a sense of patience because, you know, I think we've also recognized through thinking this through over the years as we have had crises, and we've had a crisis a couple of years ago, there have been previous ones, that, that, you know, if you try to think through sudden change in the Korean Peninsula, it's a pretty scary business. Um, and there's also the element of, if you like, uh, you know, national, you know, I'm not sure where the fashionable words are, but, but this, this is the Korean Peninsula. And, and outside powers, you know, need to be very mindful that um, there has to be an expression, I think, of, of Korean will uh, in accordance with what I would say are values that represent the 21st century, that represent democracy. But w we have to be mindful of all of that. Now, you know, where does denuclearization fit into the mix? I don't think you get to denuclearization without getting to some of the other issues in the inter-Korean process you know, a process of, again, I'm back to process, a process of reconciliation, but where does that lead you? We don't know. Yes, I think Kim Jong-un wants economic development, but I don't think he knows himself how far he can go with that uh, without uh, uh, having uh, a, a different kind of governance problem at home, you know, regardless of what kind of guarantees and trust and other things we may build. So there, there are just by definition all these kind of unknowables out there but I think with respect to you know, your question, um, you know, we, we do have to just sort of never forget that, that you know, the reason that we sort of have this challenge uh, with nuclear weapons in North Korea, and by the way, South Korea tried to develop nuclear weapons in the 1970s, and one of my predecessors went in and said, you can have the weapons or the alliance, but not both, and they stopped. But you know, this is a long-standing issue. Um, but, but absent thinking about the broader movement towards some sort of I was reconciliation, some sort of deeper ties of trust and understanding. I don't think we're going to solve these other issues, but how that plays out, I can't give you a good, a good roadmap right now, but I think that broader perspective is very important. 
It's a great question, Adnan. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank everyone who worked hard, John Park and team, for the first ever Harvard Korean Security Summit. So round of applause for them and all of our guests here for that. Um, but then if you could please help me uh, join me in thanking a very, very smart and distinguished panel for a great session as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And on admin note, I understand the, the entire conference is going to get a conference picture up here. So don't leave. We'll reposition and you'll be up here and get your first annual photo too. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Great, great.